apologies in advance for my audio quality. I'm using AirPods in a hotel lounge on the other side of the world with crappy internet. So apologies in advance that I don't, you don't get my full dulcet tones. The resonance of Stu's deep baritone. I'll just AI that shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. If you want more Draft Zero more often, please consider joining our wonderful cohort of Patreons. However, this episode in particular is brought to you by ScriptUp. Now, regular listeners know that ScriptUp are story consultants with industry expertise. They don't promise any of that access to market bullshit. They just help you make your script better via their excellent report and a follow-up feedback call. And that feedback call is super valuable. If you're like me and you think with your mouth open, you know that often discussing ideas is how you find solutions to problems. We've used script up and they were super helpful for our project. And we've also heard from listeners who sing their praises that say that their written analysis is really thoughtful and considered, but that the follow-up call really does help, that it helps them diagnose things that are unseen and also helps them spitball possible solutions in a really creative environment. But the best news we've heard recently for Stu and my ego, and also hopefully for your ego, dear listeners, is that ScriptUp has told us that when they get a script from a Draft Zero listener, those scripts are a cut above. This means that you, dear listener, must be a better writer just because you love listening to three-hour podcasts about screenwriting. (laughs) Jokes aside, I think having a shared passion for the screenwriting craft, and that's why we're all here, is awesome. Ego stroking aside, if you would like 10% off ScriptCrupp's story consultancy services, please use the promo code DZ10. And you can find the links and the promo code in our show notes. Hi, I'm Stu Willis. And I'm Chaz Fisher. And I'm Mel Killingsworth. And welcome to Shot Zero, a screenwriting podcast that's all yeah. about shots. <laughs> <laughs> Annoying Chaz. <laughs> it's kind of a Shot Zero, Draft Zero crossover. Kind of. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, today we're talking about wonders. So shots that, whether they're stitched together via CGI or whether they are all actually one continuous take or is in one of our samples today, whether it's animated and doing things that defy the laws of physics, <laughs> everything happens within one continuous shot. And we're going back to the page and seeing how the writing sets up our shots and our expectations. Yeah. And I'm just conscious here as the one person in the virtual room who does not call themselves a director that like the the key objective here is in a weird kind of way, this is a, a, a related topic to when we did unfilmables and, you know, to quote Craig Mazin, we should get a super cut of Craig Mazin saying like, it's our job to direct from the page. But I guess the, we're using one as, as a lens, an entry tool, a single aspect of filmmaking to look at how some writers have chosen to quote unquote direct from the page. Because what we're here, what we're talking about is intentionality, right? That they're creating. What is the intention of this moment? And I think the kind of one is that we're talking about have narrative purpose. It's not just a stick, right? We're not talking about a one that's like a establishing shot, which you can get, right? Where it's like, oh, we're going to do a wide shot and it comes in and finds the characters. And yes, it's a, a, a 90 second uncut shot, right? We're talking about. Uh, a scene that's effectively covered in one shot. And the reason I think that we do that on a, on a primary level is coming back to our questions of the scene, I actually think it's about unity, right? We're actually, we talked about scenes as having unity of time, unity of space, and unity of action. And I think the one kind of magnifies that unity, right? And yeah. it can be real time, and all the oneers that we are looking at play out in real time. But like one of the great one shots is like, from contact, for the Jodie Foster's character name, the young Jodie Foster, like the popcorn running up the stairs, like they do a speed ramp in that shot. They go from 24 frames per second to 60 frames per second. There's an iris pull that changes the, the <laughs> depth of field. So she's more focused and then you see her in the mirror. Like that's a cool aesthetic shot that moves out of real time. But the intentionality of it is to put us inside the experience of the character to kind of amplify the unity. So I think one of the, the main reasons to use a one and I think all these examples are, Right, is one to create that sense of unity, but it also kind of really bond us with character experience, right? Mm. I think that's the one of the reasons you to do it. And, and one of the most common types of one of which we'll look at in Goodfellas, is a follow shot, right? Because it actually literally puts us to almost a POV shot, 
right? And then you get the inverse, which is like kind of like instead of follow behind, it's a follow from the front on the character and seeing their reactions, which is a little bit different. And Hereditary does that as well. I was just going to interrupt you mid-directorial segue rant describing shots in an audio format just to mention, yes, we're doing the famous follow shot in Goodfellas. Then we're looking at the incredible motorbike chase sequence in The Adventures of Tintin and closing out with, uh, it's not the first, but like one of the many long shots in The Incredible Children of Men. But, but while we've interrupted Stu Mel, do you have anything to add? Because I, I'm not here to say this is how you direct specifically a one I'm off from the page. Uh, what I want to get from this is how do writers convey to a reader the feeling that a one gives an audience? So, Mel, what to you? Is there anything you want to add to Stu's unity as in what the effect of a one has on an audience? I think the effect can be, well, Stu mentioned um, point of view, and I think that in in one of these specific examples, the effect is to give us one specific character's point of view, and that's in Goodfellas, and in another, it's essentially to give us the the feeling that all the characters have. It's, it's almost a disconnected or um, like a, when you're having a disassociative event almost, but you're, you're feeling what they're feeling, and then in Tintin, it's almost a third Point, like God's eye point of view when you're seeing all of this massive action unfold. And I think reading the scripts does give you some of that as well. Um, particularly in Goodfellas, there are no paragraph breaks. It is all just everything that's not characters talking because there are there are a lot of bits of dialogue throughout is just chunks of text because you're meant to be swept along with this action in children of men the script has a lot of um and we'll talk about like the mini slugs right but everything's just bang 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 you can almost tell that it's happening simultaneously because of the mini slugs you know in the road in the car outside inside it's all felt as one and then in tintin you've got this just broad description of all these different actions that are happening. So I do think that the scripts convey the feeling that the ultimate shot gives. Yeah. And that's going to bring me to one of our guiding principles we had when we pick these scripts is a lot of writers are told don't write camera directions in your script. And I thought about that. And I think the reason comes back to that, what is the feeling of a shot, right? What is the feeling of this moment in a film? And if you point out what the camera is doing in the script, what you're actually saying is the film at that time is going to draw attention to the camera work. Mm. That could be a very profound thing. One of my favorite shots, um, which we discussed doing this, but it's not really a one is in Taxi Driver. There's this moment when um, Travis Pickle is calling, oh, I just blanked on Sybil Sherapid's character name. He's having an awkward phone conversation and the camera, unmotivated by physical action, dollies off down a hallway and the camera, the, the phone conversation is completely off screen and then he walks in. That camera move is drawing attention to itself yeah. right it wants you to go i can't look and it becomes a feeling but it's slightly intellectual and you could write that in we dolly off mm. and taxi driver has a few of those moments we also spoke about something similar in the invisible man mm. how often the camera would deliberately like move off or like track into an empty space that either the character was looking at or not looking at to make us feel that someone was there, whether we knew they were there or not. Mm. And that could very well be written in the page. Yeah, and I think that the convention has changed a little bit over time. The oldest shot that we discussed doing is Touch of Evil, which is a very famous one, and it did give a little bit more camera direction on the page. Goodfellas, which is the oldest one of the three that we are actually covering, does a lot of that thing that now a lot of screen editors tell you not to do, which is we see, we see this, we see that, um, and then neither of the other two do that. And so I think that a little bit of it is just that things do change over time, as mm. well as, again, you do have some writer directors, you do have some people who are writing to a specific audience, you know, they know who is going to be reading the script already, et cetera. So, you know, all rules are made to be broken, et cetera. <laughs> I'm not saying it's a rule. I'm just saying in terms of the goal is to write it, not a shooting script, but a spec script that creates the feeling in the movie. The danger of writing in camera directions is that you draw the reader's attention mm. to what the camera is doing. Mm. And that is like the moment you notice what the camera is doing in the film. And that should be something to under control of. Absolutely. And it often feels too didactic as well. Mm. That said, just to do two contrary examples up front from the films that we're doing, 
we've talked about this on Just Zero before, I can't remember which episode, but in The Born Identity by Tony Gilroy, there's this wonderful moment when Jason Bourne is hanging on a ledge outside of the American consulate and 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 Tony Gilroy wants a very specific feeling for the audience. I'm going to handball it over to Megan May, the co-writer and one of the voice actors in Starship Q-Star, to read this script excerpt. In fact, she's going to be reading all the script excerpts in today's episode. Over to you, Megan. Exterior U.S. consulate building wall. Day. Born still hanging there. Looking down. Up. There's no choice. He has to go down. Born finding a toehold below him. Reaching. Touching down. It gives way. Crumbling and... Born hesitates. Does he know how to do this or not? Stall for a moment. Then... Born starts climbing down. And this is all one shot. No cutaway. No cheating. We are watching a master at work. Handhold to a drain pipe. Swinging to a better ledge. Dropping to an air conditioner. Grabbing a window frame just before the air conditioner gives way. Teetering there. Now he's on the fourth floor. (laughs) Right, and then it it just goes in and blocks out the action. So you read it with the idea that this is meant to be one shot. In the film, it is not one shot. (laughs) Right? He had lofty aspirations. (laughs) What's cool about the, this is all one shot, no cutaway, no cheating, is coming back to the unfilmables thing. He's telling us what the camera is doing. He's telling what the intention is, which is to make the stunt feel real and to make us feel that Bourne is the real deal, right? A master at work. So it comes back to that idea that it clarifies the intention. This is in contrast to Hereditary, the end of Hereditary. We come to a close-up of Peter. He looks confused and scared, although not in a way that feels like Peter. We will hold on this close-up for the remainder of the scene. The sound of someone rising. This person, Joan, shuffles past Peter to lift the crown off Charlie's head. She then comes to stand, now off-screen, before Peter. After a moment, the crown enters frame to be placed ceremoniously onto Peter's head. In its talents, we will hold on to see you the remainder of the scene, right? What's interesting about that moment is that then he talks about the sound of someone rising. He senses something behind him. So he he is so consciously aware that the shot is just holding on Peter that the big print changes to reflect the fact that what we are hearing and seeing is what it's basically what we are hearing and his kind of reaction to what he is seeing. And it's original from that point of view and it's very clever. So as much as it's got this kind of like what we used to call an instructable Right, It is clarifying in the big print what the experience of that moment is, and that's why I think it works. So I think you know, coming in and going, you need to write what the experience of this is. And so if you're thinking as a writer about writing in a one-up right, or something that is like long playing, you have to be thinking about what is my intention here right, and what do I want the audience to experience and try to reflect that mm. on the page. And I think Goodfellas is a great example of that. Mm. I'm going to just briefly squash your brilliant segue there, Stu. Like, I want to reiterate your point that we've chosen three examples where the the wanna or the the feeling that the wanna gives in each of these examples is a has a narrative purpose to it. But you're drawing, a, I think, a good distinction between when you're writing camera work into the script, you're kind of in a way bumping the reader out or making the reader they're not in the story; they're thinking about how the story is going to be presented. And I do think there are wanna's for audiences that deliberately do the same thing, mm. right? There, I think there are a lot of wonners out there that don't serve any narrative purpose. It's just they're there <laughs> for people to go, did they cut? Isn't that amazing? Oh, that's so pretty. But if it goes on long enough, I do think you loop back around. Like yeah. we talked about the bear, right? Like, so the bear, they do an entire episode that is a wonner. Mm. And I start watching and I'm in it. And as soon as I notice like five minutes in, I think, oh, Oh, they're doing this. They're doing this. But then you just get carried away in it and you forget that that's what they're doing. So if it goes long enough, you almost fall back into it again. Yeah. I mean, just before we jump into that, and we, we're not going to do it as an example, but the difficulty with the one is you get like the 1917 problem. I describe 1917 as my favorite video game adaption. It feels like Medal of Honor, World War One, the movie. Because by so committing to the one they have to create contrivances in the narrative because there's no time jumps, right? There's so much unity of time, unity of action, and unity of space mm. that they can't have time jumps. So everything is conveniently at the exact right time. <laughs> and it feels like a video game where you just finish the action sequence and the next cutscene starts, but there's not, you know, within the, the game mm. engine. 
So I think that's what's interesting about all these three examples is they don't feel contrived, right? And I think sometimes you get that kind of contrivance, you know, the kind of action movie one shot of everyone fighting and it just happens to be perfectly timed. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, we're already talking about Quaron. So we polled our Patreons and there was a lot of great TV examples, like um, Mel's mentioned The Bear. True Detective came up. uh, I really wish we'd been able to do that episode of The Haunting of Hill House, which is also a one but does like intercuts the same characters but in different ages so they move from the haunting when the children are young to the to a funeral scene when the children are all middle-aged mm. and, but it's all one and, and it's as they f- physically follow the characters and i would have been fascinated to be able to find the script to see what he was doing on the page there like i presume there would have been intention written into it as well because it's such a stark confrontation it's like a Brechtian distancing thing initially, right? Like it is drawing attention to the fact that this can't be continuous action. So why have they done that? Mm. So Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Breaking Bad. Yeah, I had several Marvelous Mrs. Maisel wonders in mind as well. I just, I couldn't find any of the scripts for the right, the ones I wanted to study. Often there are pilot scripts out there and then occasionally you'll find like for your consideration scripts of particular episodes, but- other than that, it's really hard to find. So thank you, patrons, for all your amazing suggestions. But uh, these are the ones we ended up with. So now I'm going to reopen Stu's <laughs> amazing- uh, It's the famous shot. It's the famous Coca Cabana shot. If you haven't seen it, Goodfellas is about a guy played by Ray Liotta named Henry who always wanted to be a gangster. And in this scene, he's taking Karen, his girlfriend- to the Copacabana nightclub and he goes in through a back entrance and he's trying to show off. Goodfellas by Nicholas Pileggi and Martin Scorsese. Exterior Copacabana night. Henry gives the keys and rolled up $20 bill to the doorman at the building across the street and steers Karen towards the Copa. We see Henry deftly steer Karen away from the Copa's main entrance and down the basement steps. A huge bodyguard, eating a sandwich in the stairwell, gives Henry a big hello. We see Henry walk right through the basement kitchen, which is filled with Chinese and Latino cooks and dishwashers who pay no attention. Karen is being dragged along, open-mouthed, at the scene. Henry starts up a stained kitchen staircase through a pair of swinging doors, and suddenly Karen sees she is inside the main room. The harried maitre d', he is surrounded by customers clamouring for their tables, waves happily at Henry and signals to a captain. We see a table held aloft by two waiters wedging their way towards the stage and plant the table smack in front of what had until that moment been a ringside table. As Henry leads Karen to their seat, she sees that he is nodding and shaking hands with many of the other guests. We see Henry quietly slip $20 bills to the waiters. We see the captain approach with champagne. Karen watches Henry turn around and wave at a 280-pound hood. Henry turns to the stage where the lights begin to dim and Henny Youngman walks out. This is also a sister episode, I think, to our White Space Mm. episode. Yes, 100%. Because what I like about this episode is I think we've got good examples of actually when a big fuck-off block of text can actually serve you well in terms of that feeling Mm. Of immediacy mm. ongoing. It's breathless. It's literally breathless. Like Stu's trying to read the whole thing and it's breathless. And that's how you feel watching it. There's that continuity of action. There's the continuity of action. The repetition of the we see does that continuity as well. What's interesting is it's actually the we see is calling out what meets the choreography we are catching and then coming back to our main point of focus. So without overly getting into how you direct a one, and I think the longest take I've ever shot is like two minutes. Uh, Mel might have more experience of it than me. Um, but you, in camera terms, we often talk about positions. So you've got like, and that's related to Mark. So you've got first position, second position, third position. That's where the camera is, or the actors are, focus points, etc. Um, and so something like this is calling out the positions of where the camera is meant to be pointed. The other thing you're often doing with a one is where is the audience looking? You get, if, if you do the taxi driver thing where you pan off something, right, and there's no action that you're following, you're drawing attention to what the camera is doing. So this one they're following behind the character, so it's on a steady cam. The camera operator is walking behind the character, 
following them, noticing things that are motivated by action, and then coming back. And so the script is calling out the key things that the camera needs to see, right, without going into what is the actual choreography of all the elements in play. Now, like just in terms of like fashion and style, I feel like now there would be an expectation that each of those sentences would be like a separate paragraph just Mm. to break up that block of text and maybe there would be less we sees. But then what I think that would be replaced with is some form of repetition at the beginning of the sentence to to keep that continuity going and maybe either some ellipses or some double dashes at the end to make it feel like it's flowing on. Or you might do, we follow we. Yeah. Right? At the beginning, we follow Henry. Yeah. Dash, dash, or Colin. He, he drifts through the, you know, he moved, they move through the, the, the yeah. dot, 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 new line and through the kitchen. Duh, 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 duh. And like you could break it up, but I think you would probably need to do something like the born identity or hereditary and just give it a little bit of a framing device. But, but it, it doesn't, doesn't have to be, we see them. Like, <laughs> there's plenty of scripts that I've read. True Detective comes to mind because we brought it up that we'll do follow or we follow, you know, as part of the, the writing because it's important, right? We follow Henry. It's not just, what you were saying, the intention is we want to be with Henry. And more importantly, we actually want to be with Carol in that moment. Right. This is her point of view. Yes. This scene is all about how Karen feels. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're swept along into his world. And this is, um, it's actually cutting away from Karen uh, introducing her to her mother. And it's just, she's getting swept up with his charisma. We're seeing him do all these things. The whole point of Karen in this scene is just to sort of, we're following along in her back. And even though we see her, it's her point of view. Mm. She's seeing him interacting with all these people. He's the one that's physically active in the scene. He's the one that's glad handing and giving 20s and everyone's greeting him and not her. And they know him and he's, hey, how you doing? You know, and joking with the waiters making out in the corner and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's her getting swept up into his world and swept up in his charisma. And like before she even knows it, she's through this line and through the back door and seeing all these things happen. And now she's in the front row and people are talking to, you know, so it's, it's about feeling like her watching him and getting swept away into his world. I mean, you could, if if you want to write this in a spec form, and this is me just spitballing an idea, rather than doing something more technical like follow, you could do Karen and then brackets and us are swept up with Henry as he, mm. boom. And so you're actually describing the emotional effect on the character. And so that makes it feel more justified to be in the script because it's about emotion, not technicality. I think it's just more literal than this script gets in terms of the script never really tells us whose whose feelings we're with or whose, you know, point of view we're in. It's just every script has a different method, but you're right. Like you could absolutely do that. And again, I think some of that comes down to, you know, the fact that this was written, uh, you know, 35 years ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think that some of it's just a little bit changing times. I think I probably would do that if I were writing it now. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm just speculating how to, like, we actually had a brief chat about modernizing it, the modern mm. spec market where there is, mm. you know, there is controversies, unfortunately, around technicalities and mm-hmm. script. And, and I do think learning experience is good. And if you can ground choices in the emotion of the character or the reader using something like swept up, which is your word. I was just like, oh, that's mm. great because yeah. that's exactly what the intention is. Mm-hmm. So write it in. We are swept up with, like, coming back to the hereditary example, it's like, we hold on Peter's tail, right? Like he just says, we hold in this in CU. It's a little bit more instructive and he writes it in italics, but it's he's a writer-director. But, but I, I think, think respect for it. I would probably try to frame that. We hold in the close-up with the character's emotion. I mean, that, that would be my only criticism of how actually this paragraph is written. Mm. Like it clearly is about Karen's experience, but then it just completely leaves her. It never, you know, goes back to her reaction at all. And maybe that's because, you know, what the writer is telling is to never turn around, like that we are only in a follow shot. Like it's suggesting that by only talking about the action that's in front of her and never going back to Mm. how that looks on her face. And we don't know whether this version of the script that we're looking at you know, Scorsese has said to the writer, I'm going to do this as a one and please write it like that. Or whether he has written it in this way such that Scorsese has read it and gone, oh, that has to be 
a one-er because of just the breathlessness of it. He's co-wrote the script, so it's possible that he specifically wrote in the we see to be a checklist for everything that, like, he's actually come up from the, I need these actors, I need this. These are all the choreography that we're going to have to work out that we can then time and capture. You know? And I think the specificity of even the types of people who are in the background suggests that because he's clearly drawing that class distinction. So the specificity of the you know the people who are in the kitchen versus the people who are in the the main room like that's very very intentional. Yeah. So I definitely think that there's some of that that flavor that is sprinkled throughout suggests that whether he wrote it, co-wrote it, mm. told the writer what he was thinking, like, oh, I want this to be a scene that shows, you know, class and the light and dark and the this and that. I think that that's all clearly suggested. Mm, I feel bad. We should actually say who the... It's on the... Yep. It's Nicholas Pelleggi. Yes, I'll ask the Italian to pronounce the Italian. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be a Draft Zero episode without a very poorly pronounced last name. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean we can wax lyrical about the writing and the directorial choice here but we could all imagine the mtv or you know into the spider-verse edit version of this yeah. where it's just like constantly cutting very quickly to what karen's seeing and then back to her reaction as it is like just all about her you know being overwhelmed by and trying to uh, replicate that in the audience. And obviously, this is a very different choice. Well, they could have stuck in a camera in the corner. Like, so you see them cross the road, you see a camera in the stairs, they walk past the camera as they go down the stairs, you stick the camera in the kitchen, and it kind of just pans with them as they walk through hmm. the kitchen. And it's got some nice shoot through. So you get some nice foreground action. And we've seen those shots before foreground action. And you see them in the background, cut, cut. You pick them up on the other side of their, as they come into the restaurant and you kind of again pan or track with them. Like this could have been many, many shots yeah. to kind of get those moments and still nicely choreographed. But the way it is written, that kind of breathless style, as Mel said, is like we are in the moment, experience it with Alan. And as you say, it's about Alan being kind of in awe. Yeah, because I think the technique that you're talking about makes her feel almost frazzled. It mm. makes her feel like she's overwhelmed. It's like a sensory overload. Whereas with the oneer, you feel like she's carried away and she's a bit overwhelmed, but it's not an overload. It's her along in the wake of Henry's impeccable charisma. So I, I think that, you know, sometimes you can get across the same feeling with different techniques, but I really think that this technique is, is you'd get a very different vibe from um, different, you know, th what you just discussed as opposed to even a follow going the other way. It's showing us what she's feeling instead of putting us, quote unquote, in her shoes. Yeah. We very deliberately chosen, I think, there's a real virtue to having one as that is performance based as well, but they don't need directing from the page to say that. So one one that we considered is that amazing scene in Hunger where it's just, you know, that two shot of these incredible performances talking after there has been so much silence in the film before. Mm. And, you know, once again, it's a writer director co-writing, but there wouldn't have been much, I think, reason on the page to draw attention to that choice. It just been like the appearance of dialogue on the page after so much white space and action would have had a similar effect. Like, you know, the eyeballs would have been sucking up that dialogue. Mm. And obviously it allows actors to be more in the moment. And so there are performance reasons. And one recent performance that wasn't a one but was shot that way is famously the, you know, the succession scene. And I'm going to mm. Not spoil anything for Stu, who has not watched any Succession, and I'm just going to shame him in that way. But they deliberately put a number of cameras fixed around a room and let the entire scene play out to try and capture a different style of acting performance in those scenes. I think Stu might be slightly spoiled because I did the Sean Shot Zero, <laughs> where I found that the cutting from the one to the other was... Yeah, yeah. And the lens, focal length change, making it jump. Mm-hmm. The other related to Hunger, one well, of the other famous one shots, which is Hunger is probably taking inspiration from, is the phone call from all the president's men, right? It's just a six minute tracking dot into Robert Redford while he's calling a contact and he's got multiple phone calls. The thing is, you read the script and it's just literally him on the phone. So you sit there and go, what am I going to mm. cut to? <laughs> right? You could sit there and go, we're going to shoot it from two angles. 
right? We're going to maybe we'll have to do a bit of coverage. Fincher might cover it, right? You know, he might do a French over from up and above, which means French over is from behind over the shoulder. You know, there's ways you could shoot it with coverage to give yourself performance options. And in fact, the tape that they've used, a Robert Fedford, he actually fucks up the name. He, he butchers the script. Then he's in the zone, so he picks up and corrects himself and actually makes it feel more real. And the great thing about that shot is they've got all the buzzing background of it being a, a newspaper and to get a lot of background action that's not written into the script. And then you dolly in and then it kind of just isolates on Red character, uh, Bob Woodward, as he kind of basically cracks Watergate. Mm. It's a great shot. But again, it's something that when you read the scripts, you're like, yeah, I, I can see why the director came to this conclusion of this is a way to do this. But it doesn't come across as intentionality from mm. William Gold- Goldman. And William Goldman definitely wrote in shots. like having Oh, my God. Script. He wrote in shots. And he wrote in shots and angles. And it's of that style, you know, angle on. You know, using character names as slug lines and stuff like that. So he's got a little bit of that kind of, you know, cut to this angle on that in there. And then this moment he's just written as the the phone conversation. Didn't Goldman also do Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? Yeah. But that's got like I, I read the script for that once and I'm I'm gonna butcher this. I'm, I'm paraphrasing from memory, but it was something like this is gonna be the longest, fastest dolly shot in the history of cinema. <laughs> Doesn't he write freeze frame at the end of that as well? I can't remember. That's the one that stayed with me. I'm pretty sure that's actually written in the script, which is, again, it's just, but I guess when you're William Goldman, you know, you can do that. Yeah. I mean, that's just to say one of the reasons why, I mean, we've got two writer directors in our three options and and the middle one is an animation, which we'll, we'll talk about the script considerations of that in a second. But I think it is, you know, Sue and I have been uh, harangued separate podcast about us criticizing how much he cheated in one of his scripts. And that's the thing that you can do when you're a writer director. It wasn't a criticism, right? He no. was writing intention. <laughs> no such thing as cheating. Yes. He was writing intention. And then his, his argument was that he was then working out how to realize this intention with yeah. the, the practical execution of it. And I, I think intention, all the work, things that Mel was describing about this shot in Goodfellas, you know, we're about here and it's not about her being flustered. That's intentionality. Don't be hung up on the idea about it being one shot or maybe it's two mm. shots. The intentionality is that we want to be. So how do you as the writer in the spec script make sure that the language that you are choosing is saying we are being swept up with this character and you might have to cheat, quote, yeah. unquote. <laughs> it's an audio medium, but Stu has put really big <laughs> quotes on either side of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. But you might have to call that out in the script for people to understand. And that's something that suddenly we found Daz and I with spec scripts, both what we worked on together and separately, that sometimes you just need to be clear about what your intention is because people read fast. <laughs> Subtlety is lost. Um, speaking of not subtle and different intentionality, should we do think thing? Because I'm not like, what is the intention of this being a one shot action chase kind of thing? I would say it is what I mentioned before is like Spielberg is drawing our attention to like wow factor here. Mm hmm. Yep, this is just about like, oh, there's this freedom that animation allows and this is impressive and this is big and this is, whoa, like that. that is it. I, not as a slam, that's great. What is the, like, uh, unless you're going to read the whole script, kind of give me the synopsis of the scene. Like, you, we don't need the synopsis of the scene. Yeah. We do need the synopsis of the scene. So they're in a coastal town they've been attending an opera performance and the villain is there and Tintin and Captain Haddock and Snowy are together and there is a literal kind of mini adventure in this whole sequence there's a MacGuffin there's the three pieces of a scroll which get lost and are being chased and in particular there is some edits in the beginning of this sequence but at one point it chooses to stop cutting and just continues through the rest of the action which is when a bird gets involved in the ch- in the chase a trained falcon steals a bit of the scroll and while captain haddock is fist fighting with the baddies tintin is chasing the falcon the adventures of tintin the secret of the unicorn by stephen moffat and edgar wright and joe cornish Haddock throws down the rocket launcher. The wall of the dam bursts with a thunderous boom. Angle on. Tintin and Haddock desperately attempt to outrun the wall of mud on the motorcycle. Angle on. Exterior bagger streets. Mudslide. Day. Angle on. 
saccharin as he watches the deluge behind Tintin and Haddock. Tintin skillfully navigates the motorcycle as Tom desperately steers the jeep down flooded streets. Angle on, saccharin looking behind them. Saccharin POV. A torrent of mud is bearing down on them. Tintin's motorcycle is getting closer. Tintin and Haddock drive past on motorbike with sidecar. Snowy leaps into the jeep and tries to grab the scrolls. Saccharin tries to keep them from Snowy, only to have the scrolls grabbed by Tintin. Snowy jumps back to the motorcycle. Saccharin's falcon flies after Tintin and Haddock. He swoops down. The mudslide slams into the city buildings, destroying everything in its path. A tank bursts through the wall behind them and Haddock is banged on the head by a barrel. Haddock's coat is snagged by the tank cannon and he is lifted from the sidecar. The scrolls slip from Tintin's hand. Haddock grabs two. Snowy grabs the scroll before it flutters away. The motorcycle breaks in two, and Tintin and Snowy sail off in different directions. Haddock hangs from the barrel of the tank. The tank careens and slides all over the road, smashing Haddock from one wall into the other. Haddock hangs precariously over the edge of a drop. Haddock falls through lines of washing. Haddock loses another scroll, which flutters up into the air. The scroll flutters in the air. Haddock tries to grab it. The falcon swoops in and snatches the scroll. Haddock gives chase, cursing as he goes. Tintin collects Haddock on the front of his motorbike. Snowy rides atop the mudslide and manages to capture the falcon, pinning him down with the scroll still in his beak. They race alongside Tintin and Haddock. Haddock launches himself at the falcon. He manages to upset Snowy and the bird. They fly through the air into a building as Snowy hangs on by his teeth to the scroll the falcon holds in its talons. Haddock ends up inside the building. He swirls around and around, and the mud rises higher. Haddock grabs Snowy. Winded, Snowy lets go of the scroll. The falcon snatches the scroll. Saccharin arrives in the jeep. He raises his arm to the bird. Tintin intercepts the falcon. He grabs the bird and manages to get two of the scrolls before the falcon escapes. The motorcycle is smashed on a bridge, and Tintin uses the handlebars to ride electrical wires like a zipline. He runs along the walls of buildings, smashes into poles and rides a lantern after the falcon, the threads that still entangle the bird just beyond his grasp. Just as the falcon loses Tintin, he jumps from a balcony and grabs the falcon. Time slows as Tintin slowly aligns the scrolls, still locked in the talons of the falcon. The mysterious symbols slowly become numbers. So what do you think the intentionality is? I'm turning this in an interview, but you're more familiar with the shot than me. What do you think the intentionality is? You said spectacle, mm. but is it just beyond that? Is it to kind of raise the stakes or is it, you know, Spielberg does a lot of one and we should link to the great video breaking down his one but he does a lot of one that are just like combining coverage and being really efficient. This is definitely like I'm having fun. Yeah. I can only go by my feeling as the audience. I think this is genuinely just about spectacle. I think there could have been efficiencies in the edit that he chose not to use. In particular, I think how the one starts where it's very clever, but it, you know, they're heading downhill, like this entire town is like sloped downhill in a very sort of Mediterranean coastal way. Mm. And it starts with Captain Haddock on one platform fist fighting and it drops down and finds Tintin going around a corner on the motorbike. And what I like about the script is it doesn't ever draw attention to the fact now so you, you've worked in animation a long time and we've spoken about animation before we don't know how much this script was just like a transcription of previs so we don't know but it is never at any point saying this is all going to be one shot and it does move between the different characters and the different actions and it keeps the characters capitalized which I think is really important for the read. And it starts each line with the character in cap. So it's kind of like you were talking earlier about the positions in the one it's orienting you in the action as to what you're looking at and who's doing what. Not just the characters, but all the really key things like the smoke explosion, the rocket launcher, like all those sorts of things that are really crucial. It capitalizes all of them, which again, because of animation, it's almost capitalizing what gets featured in not in each shot because it's a wonder, but in each frame, you know, oh, this is actually what's really important in this moment of this shot is the rocket launcher, is the trigger, mm-hmm. is the cloud of smoke, is the falcon, is the etc. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Coming back to it, you know, I don't know how the film was made. I had two poly 
work on the previous pretend team. One of them, um, Kevin Sorison and, and Kyle Ashley, they're super talented. And it's very possible that they just started previewing this sequence. It's also possible. I mean, as far as I know, Spielberg hasn't used boards for a while because they're not spatial enough for him, right? Like, as in, they just give you 2D frames, but like. Like, not enough 3D? Yeah. It's, it's hard to communicate perspective stuff. But it's possible this was very organic, that the writers were coming up with ideas and the storyboard artists or the previous were doing things before, which definitely happens in animation. And it's not like, oh, it's just the previous artists. It can be that they sit with the writers or Spielberg or all of them in a room and spitball. But at the moment, I think there are things that you can talk about. They seem to have caught something of the intentionality and the spirit of the shot oh, in the script. Definitely. And we should learn from that, regardless of how the sausage was made. I mean, so I've already named one tool that they use, which is similar to, I think, what they've done in all three scripts, which is they very much each line anchor the position or the, the point of view or what the, the action is. And then they've done two very different, I feel like, tools, like white space tools. There are lots of just single lines ending in ellipsis, like next line. I'll give you some examples. Um, Haddock hangs precariously over the edge of a drop, ellipsis. Haddock falls through the lines of watching, ellipsis. Haddock loses another scroll, which flutters up into the air, exclamation mark. The scroll flutters in the air. Haddock tries to grab it, full stop. The falcon swoops in and snatches the scroll, ellipsis. Haddock gives chase, cursing as he goes. Tintin collects Haddock on the front of his motorbike, full stop. So each of those are a single paragraphs, like broken up tons of white space. Each line starts with the character, you know, in caps at the beginning. And, you know, the, the ellipsis gives that feeling of continuity of action, but sometimes it repeats the action. You know, that the repetition of flutters up in the air is, I think, important. But then what it also does is has a number of moments where there are blocks of text as well. So I'm just going to read two, which is a three-line paragraph and then a four-line paragraph. Snowy rides atop the mudslide and manages to capture the falcon, pinning him down with the scroll still in his beak, exclamation mark. They race alongside Tintin and Haddock. Tintin, nice work, Snowy, don't let him go. Then the next four-line paragraph. Haddock launches himself at the falcon, ellipsis. He manages to upset Snowy and the bird, Dash. They fly through the air into a building as Snowy hangs on by his teeth to the scroll the falcon holds in his talons, exclamation mark. Haddock ends up inside the building, ellipsis. He swirls around and around as the mud rises higher. So even that's kind of more like what they were doing in Goodfellas, like this breathless continuity of action. And, you know, it's interesting to see the two different types because you can imagine it almost being broken up into mini sequences within the action shot, like the locations change or the mode of transport changes, whether the characters are together or apart, all of that changes. But never are you lost as to what is going on. The actual words on the page are very efficient. There's very few adjectives in there. My other observation, and this may lean more into directing, but they're doing it on the page, which is Goodfellas was a follow, right? Like, as in, we're following my character, and it kind of picked up some other action, but you feel that it comes back to the character. This is doing a lot of handovers, right? So you follow character A, who meets character B. B walks over to C, C comes back to A, right? So it's making sure that the links in the chain, which is what you need to make a one at work, if you want to feel like it's motivated, they're doing it on the page. It flutters up in the air, then you've got the falcon coming in, and then this happens. And that's why it needs to reorientate you to make it feel like it's connected, right? That it's got the connective tissue as much as possible, because otherwise you're going to be like, well, how do I get from character A to character C or action A to action C, right? Like they're trying to create that feeling and choreography of those elements on the page, don't you think? Yeah, 100%. The repetition is creating those links in the chain. Yeah without drawing attention to it, right? I'll just read one more paragraph because this one uses a slightly different technique of doing exactly what you just described. This one instead is on page 101. Uh, the motorcycle is smashed on a bridge, comma, and Tintin uses the handlebars to ride electric wires like a zip line, full stop. He runs along the walls of buildings, comma, smashes into poles and rides a lantern after the falcon. Comma, the threads that still entangle the bird just beyond his grasp, exclamation mark. And, you know, that's demonstrating everything we spoke about before, but I want to just 
uh, highlight their use of capitalization. So instead, you know, you can use whatever you want. You can use bold, italics, underline, whatever it is that works for you. But they have capitalized motorcycle, then Tintin, then handlebars, then electrical wires, then zipline, then walls, then buildings, then smashes, then poles, then lantern, then falcon, and then threads. And each of those are kind of, you can see them being focuses of the camera or a change of location or like orienting you in the shot. Yeah, what are the key elements? Makes me think a little bit, a slight tangent, but coming back to the All the President's Men example, we're talking about this one shot. What's interesting about the choice of that one shot is it's immediately following a montage, right? So All the President Men has a montage of them finding documents. They find this clue, cut to this one shot. There's a rhythm thing to it. And that's part of what makes a one up work is the rhythm of the choreography within the shot, but there's also the lack of rhythm that's created by the lack of cutting, right? You know, one is are interesting because they have to create the rhythm through the choreography of elements rather through cutting shots, right? And so your capitals are creating rhythm, right? They're orientating the reader, but they're helping giving that sense of this thing is propulsive, even if we're not cutting a scene, and cutting between scenes or cutting between ostensible camera setups. And it's almost like this da, 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 da. Like yeah. if you're looking at the page and you see these, the small caps, the big caps, the small caps, the big caps, uh. it is very, it's almost musical. There's there's a pattern to it that you can sort of feel. And, and as you go, it's it's not choppy, but it's very- Staccato? You know, uh, a few longs and a short and a few longs and a short. Yeah, staccato. I think what's interesting about this scene is it's a set piece, right? And that's a little bit different. Goodfellas is not a set piece. King of Man is a set piece, but it's got different purposes. This has got, and we'll talk about it a little bit more like about this in Game of the Scene, is that it's got, like, as you say, down the hill, very clear motivation, get the MacGuffin. The character is irrelevant. What the characters do reflects who they are, but it's not about us beginning to deepen our understanding of who these characters are, right? And so they simplify all of that stuff they, so they can have a lot of micro plotting. So I think anything when to do a sequence like this, you might need to strip it out, but make sure that we understand what the arena is. This is the terminology I'll when we eventually talk about the game that they're seeing. We need to understand what the, the, the arena is and what the kind of the goal, what is the victory condition of this set piece, which is get the scroll, right? Yeah. Or the bird, which has the scroll at that time. And I, so I actually, to, to be frank, I watched this for this podcast. Like I haven't seen the movie and I watched this one or, and it was immediately clear to me what was happening the action, who was who, what was being chased, and then again, the the objective of the scene. You know, even and then I went back and read the script and then it became so but that's it's really obvious within the set piece. I was never confused. I was never lost. It's inherent within the way that it's shot, but then if you read it, it's also inherent in the way it's written. It's an interesting comparison to uh Game Style, right? So Game Style has a centerpiece. It's somewhat like this, which is get the MacGuffin. In Game Zone, if you haven't seen it, the MacGuffin is a Fabergé egg. And they basically play, as they describe it in the script, a game of hot potato. Hero characters are being chased and they're throwing this egg to each other. We did a little bit of a breakdown of it on Shot Zero. But all the script basically says is, and they play a high stakes game of hot potato. <laughs> they do underline that line. Yeah. <laughs> no rules. <laughs> It's almost like they knew that the choreography was going to be so dependent on the physical space, right? And the directors did the similar kind of game in their Dungeons and Dragons film, which was the chasing the, the druid who's constantly transforming and following her. It's the same kind of concept. It's a little bit of a game. And they've done it as a one to kind of emphasize that. But what's interesting about this script as you highlighted is they're actually giving us the dig down. They're not relying on, I mean, maybe they did storyboard it and they did a post script on it, or it's a combination of all of these elements. But the fact is, even if it's a transcript, it's an incredibly good transcript and effective one of creating the feeling. There's so much micro plotting, like even so much more than, I mean, in Game Night, they've not done any of the micro plotting, perhaps deliberately, <laughs> but in Dungeons and Dragons, again, that what that doing that scene as a one actually does is as much as the character, the audience is behind is the druid. It kind of puts you more in the empathetic position of the guards chasing her. Because she keeps, you know, disappearing and reappearing and you're kind of surprised as they are when she changes or what she's doing. It makes her look awesome. Yeah. That's the intention of that shot. It's about how clever she is 
It's like a, not an arc of awesome, but it's like, yeah, this character's cool. <laughs> yeah. It's what we talked about before. T- sometimes if we need to make a character feel impressive, like Sherlock, we actually have mm-hmm. to withhold information from the audience that we are surprised by what they are doing. And that makes them seem smart. If we're ahead of the character, it makes them seem dumb. Yeah. All right. Well, do we want to go to our final yes. example, which is one of the, it, there are so many great oneers in Children of Men that when Mel said in her thread, the car one, I thought it was a different oneer because <laughs> one of my favorite shots in Children of Men is when they're escaping the farm and the oneer starts with him pushing the car silently down the hill and it stays with them like in and out of the car as people are chasing and goes right to the bottom of the hill. And the holding in that oneer makes you feel their terror. Like it really makes you empathize with them because, you know, most people who've had a manual car in their life have had to push start a manual car and know what that terror is like without people chasing you and trying to shoot you. But that is not the shot that Mel has selected. <laughs> Too many wonders in a great, great way. So, Mel, which is the, the moment of Children of Men that you've selected for us? So, I've chosen what I think is the first big wonder. We, we definitely have a few that track through uh, the streets, but I wouldn't necessarily call them entire scenes. They're more, they're more world-building based. And the one that I've chosen is the one where... Julian and Theo are reconnecting and then all of a sudden while everyone is in the car terrorism happens and you know chaos ensues. So if you haven't seen the film, right? So I don't think we need to do a synopsis of the whole film. You've essentially got uh you've got Julian and Theo and we know they have a past. We know they used to be married and they're not married anymore. And we know that Julian is still an activist and Theo used to be. And Julian has kind of dragged Theo back into this world because there's these other three characters in the car and there's this activism that Theo's still a little bit unclear of that they've sort of dragged him to look, help us do this thing with this young girl. You'll be well recompensed and you'll, you know, come back to your roots. So you've got different people in different stages of their relationship with different motivations all in the one place. And we're still a little bit unclear what they are. And one of the other things that fascinates me about this is that the action in the script remains almost the same as what you get in the film. However, the dialogue and the conversation that happens is completely different. And that's really fascinating. So they're in this car, they're going somewhere, right? They're bonding. And then there is a car blocks them off. This this flaming car, yeah, this car that's lit on fire, like comes into the road and blocks their path. They're getting stopped and they're getting attacked. That is kind of the the synopsis of the scene. It is ten set piece. And does it it ends with Joanne getting killed, right? Yeah. It actually doesn't end with that. That happens about midway through. She's killed, but the wonder continues. The wonder continues. We actually get out of the car and we see one of the other people in the car shoot two cops dead. Like the cops have come along, the terrorists have fled. The person who was the driver, who was Julian's current compatriot, gets out and shoots the cops. And Theo has just seen his ex-wife killed in front of him, still isn't quite sure what's happening. Suddenly, this driver's killed two cops, the terrorists have fled, and Theo just gets out and is like, what the fuck? And because it's been a wonder up until that point, yes, we've been inside of everyone's headspace, but as soon as he gets out and says that, we're with him, we're like, what has just happened? Everything has changed in the course of this, you know, I think it's like six pages. All of a sudden, everything's been upended that that he thought he knew, that we thought we knew. We've been introduced to all these groups of people. All these different things have happened. Oh, all of a sudden, all these people are dead and we're back in the car and we're driving away. And we're quite breathless because it, it has been very continuous. Things have been happening constantly. Children of Men. Screenplay by Alfonso Curon and Timothy J. Sexton. A Fiat Multipla passenger wagon comes around the corner, heading towards Theo. It stops in front of him. The back door is opened. Theo looks inside, Luke at the wheel, Julian beside him. Two other women in the back seat. Theo climbs in. As the door closes, the Multipla starts off. Interior Multipla wagon driving, continuous. The Multipla pulling away. Theo accommodating himself, glancing at the woman seated beside him in the middle seat. Key, 21, is dark-skinned, West Indies. 
When she was born, the world was already falling apart. She grew up knowing human life would not last much longer than her. To Julian. Theo and Key lock eyes. Key looks away. Theo looks around the car. Miriam, 58, shy woman, Scottish, simply dressed, string bracelets. She can't believe it's the end of the world. It's not in the stars. Theo senses the tension in the car. Everyone is nervous. Theo makes himself comfortable against the door and closes his eyes, dozing. Exterior Canterbury roads. Day. The roads of Canterbury are curvy, running through the woods and small hills. The multiply cruises along. And this is where the one actually begins. Interior multiply driving. Day. A hand reaches over, nudging Theo awake. Theo's eyes open. Julian smiles. Theo looks out the window at the wooded hills passing by, getting his bearings. Key laughs at a small TV flipped down from the ceiling. On TV, Miriam spots something out the window, through the windshield up ahead. A burning car comes rolling down a small hill, towards the road they're travelling on. Luke accelerates. The multiplier responds grudgingly. The multiplier picks up speed, the burning car careening down the road, but it looks like they may beat it. Luke slams the brakes, screeching to a stop, just avoiding. We now intercut between the road and the multiplier. Road. The flaming car cuts them off. Smash! Crashing into a derelict car. Inside the multiplier. Tense silence. The road is now blocked by the flaming car. They hear war cries. Emerging from the trees. Zeds. A gang of twenty-ish males. Faces painted. Some masked. Armed with stones. Sticks and knives. A tribe of hunters descending down the road in a wave, running at them. Inside the multiplier. Crack! The first stone hits the window. Instead, Luke throws the car into reverse, screeching the car backwards. The Zed's upon them, running down the car. Crack! Sticks and fists pounding, bodies piling on. Luke keeps pedal to the metal, screaming in reverse, the last Zed's dropping off, giving chase, but can't catch up. Road. A lone motorcycle comes from behind the burning car, two riders in masks, racing through the Zeds, accelerating, towards the multiplier, coming closer. Inside the multiplier. Luke can't go any faster backwards. The motorcycle catches up, running alongside them. The Zed on the Zed on back looks in the car, his eyes visible for an instant through his black mask. Luke accelerates, and the motorcycle drops back, riding now in front of the car. Theo sees the Zed on the back of the motorcycle rise up. He's aiming a high-powered rifle at them. Bang! The bullet crashes through the windshield. Julian jolts with the impact, blood spraying, the passengers screaming in terror and disbelief. In the car, screaming to Miriam. Miriam uses her body to protect Key. Theo is reaching over the seat, coming to Julian. She's been hit in the neck. She's bleeding badly. Her eyes are open, alive, barely. Road. The motorcycle accelerates again, coming back alongside them. Inside the multiplier. Theo sees the motorcycle approach, the Zed on back, pointing the gun at him, about to shoot. Abruptly, Theo throws open his door. Road. Whack! Theo's car hits the motorcycle. The driver trying to keep balance, but he's going too fast. The motorcycle careens and spills, throwing the gunman into the grass, the driver bouncing across the pavement, leaving lots of skin behind. Inside the multiplier. Luke slows the car just enough to execute a turn, spinning a 180, heading away from the ambush, finally driving forward. Theo holds her throat with both hands, trying to damn the blood with his fingers. Julian reaches towards her throat, grabbing one of Theo's hands. She squeezes the hand, holding it tightly. Miriam rubs her palms together, laying healing hands onto Julian's head, holding them there. Theo's still holding Julian's wounds in her hand, Miriam's hands on her. Julian is dead. The car is silent. Then, approaching from the distance, they hear sirens. It's a police caravan. Two squad cars and a tactical van, coming from the opposite direction. Luke plays it cool, maintaining his speed, as the caravan heads right towards them. The police caravan flies past them, headed for the scene of the ambush. There's a moment of relief. Until, in Luke's rearview mirror, One of the police vehicles breaks from the caravan, turning around, coming back towards them. Sirens screaming, the police car following, getting closer. Luke keeps driving. The policemen are right on their tail. There's no choice. Luke eases the car to a stop. Road. 
The police car skids to a stop behind the multipla. Immediately, two policemen are out of their cars, approaching, guns drawn, screaming. In the multipla, Luke watches the two policemen approach. Miriam opens her door. Theo opens his, starting to get out. Road. Luke steps out his door, one hand raised in the air. Luke pulls his other hand from the car. Bang! Luke's other hand is holding a gun, and he shot Cop 1 through the heart. Before Cop 2 can react, Luke swivels. Bang! Luke gets off another shot, taking down Cop 2. Cop 2 fires off a shot. Bang! Luke finishes Cop 2. The echo of gunfire dissipates. Theo's standing there, taking it in. The two cops lay bleeding on the ground. Silence. Theo stays there, confused. Luke levels the gun at Theo. Luke pointing the gun at Theo, who does not back down. He appears ready to finish with Theo, and Miriam can tell. Theo gets in the car. Luke gives the gun to Miriam. Interior multiplar driving, day. Luke driving away. All business taking control. There's a lot of things that you can find about the direction of this in terms, you know, you go on YouTube and they show how they, you know, cut the car apart and here's how the camera is mounted and all of those sorts of things if you're interested in the direction. But I was really interested. In fact, when I picked Wonders, this was one of the first ones that came to mind. It's I wanted to study how this was done on the page and why. And I think it's fascinating. You know, Chaz, you pointed out that they use almost these mini slugs. There's a lot of this back and forth in the mini slugs, but it never... It, it doesn't do what we saw in Goodfellas where it says, we see. And it's not something that on the page feels like it needs to be this epic set piece. But it does have this idea that all of these things are happening at once. And I think that doing it as a oneer instead of a ton of different cuts makes you feel how simultaneous and how terrified and how instantaneous your reactions have to be, whether those reactions are terror, whether those reactions are shooting people, whether those reactions are that fight or flight, right? It puts you in that fight or flight mindset of all of the characters who are in the car with you. Um, No one particular point of view, because you see all of their faces at different times. You see outside the car, it's constantly showing you a 360 um, but I think this this oneer is is all right. So what are they doing on the page to kind of create that? So there's these mini slugs. So what we're talking about is stuff that's not a specific like interior exterior. It's just something like in the multipla. That's what they is that how you even say it? I think it's multipla. Yeah, that's like in and then road, but they're not interior exterior daylight. They're just capitalized. It never says interior exterior. It's on its own line. And we do get one or two other things that say emerging from the trees, which just signifies like a direction or a vague somewhat something is coming from, but it's not interior exterior and it's never calling attention to itself. It just kind of happens along with all these other lines that are coming bang, bang, bang. It helps orientate you though and kind of breaks up. Yes. This is what we are with. This is what we are with. This is what we are with, right? Before we even get into the drive, the script does take a bit of time to say- where each character, who they are and where they're sitting in the car. To your point, Stu, to like orient us for the dialogue scene and the position and where the action is happening when people are having to reach across, you you know, where they're, where they're in the car they're reaching from and where they're reaching to. So it says, Theo looks inside, Luke at the wheel, Julian beside him, two other women in the back seat. Very efficient, but it's orienting us. This is the scene before. This is not within the one Yeah. You know, Theo climbs in, um, and then at the beginning of the next scene, Theo accommodating himself, glancing at the woman seated beside him in the middle seat. And then it, you know, introduces the other characters. But it very firmly tells us who's in the middle and the back, who's on either side, who's, like, behind the driver, who's behind Julian. So we're well oriented before the one starts. And I think that's important. It's we're oriented within the script. It's something that obviously when you're watching is almost inherent. But this is telling us where everyone sits is actually quite important. And also I think it's because the action, as you've kind of alluded to, is going to take place around the car, right? It's stuff happening in the car, the kind of the one largely fixed on the car. It's not a roving camera that 
goes outside and follows other characters and, and comes back. It's quite a bit different to the one as that we've seen. Ting Ting was following this MacGuffin almost. The MacGuffin became most of what we were following, very similar to the Games Night example, where the egg becomes the connective tissue. In Goodfellas, the one is the connective tissue is almost the moving between real space, right? That's the other advantage. You, you know, one of the advantages of a wonder in space is it makes it feel real because you feel the transitions, the boundaries. Because if you've ever worked on a soundstage where you've got real world external locations and, and internal sets, you don't often have the characters walk through doors. <laughs> or you put a green screen out the door so you can actually kind of get something that makes it feel connected. A one I help sells the physical reality of an environment, and that's why some directors use them. Here, it's not actually about the transition of space. It's about th- the characters within the car and then what's happening outside, okay? And so the, the slug lines are doing that, but what is I found really interesting is that it's written, most of the big print is written from the point of view of those inside the car. So you've got inside the multiplier, tense silence, the road is now blocked by the flaming car, they hear war cries, mini slug emerging from the trees, Zeds. So it's not cutting to like inside the trees and seeing the Zeds, it's making us hearing it. It's very similar to Hereditary. They are writing the big print from the point of view of the characters where the camera is kind of fixed to. And that early on particularly helps us understand that when we go road, motorcycle coming, that we're experiencing it from the characters. And it does pull out a few moments, which is like from through the the windscreen kind of thing, mm. right? Yeah, definitely. But it stops doing that because I kind of think it's established the idea that they're going to, as much as possible, get this as a one Yeah, it's almost all in the beginning. Theo looks out the window at the wooden hill, and it actually calls it out. Theo looks out the window at the wooded hills getting his bearings. It's almost letting us, as the reader, see how they're the people inside the car are, are trying to situate themselves. And then, you know, it does that a few times. And then once, you know, the, once that flaming car runs down the hill, everything just keeps happening so much. Can I make an observation that, you know, first of all, Mel, it would be worth you talking about the big difference between the script that we're reading and what happens in the film in the first part before the burning car appears, because in the script, it's just dialogue. Other than Theo getting his bearings, we don't really have any indication that this is supposed to be immediate, urgent, real time, anything like that. And what they've chosen to do on screen, and I presume in a future draft, is introduce one of those moments that it's an incredible character moment, but it also draws the audience's attention to the fact that this is a one So it, I think that's, uh, I'm handballing to you, Mel. <laughs> There's two big differences in the script. The first is that in the script, there is something where it talks about there's a a flip down TV that's playing this old British footage that Key, who's the new character, sort of the very unknown to everyone else in the car element, is watching and laughing at. And they've taken that out. So they've deleted that. Now, that could be a practical element because of the way that they've had to build the car. But I actually think that it's also... It's something that could almost be too distracting. If you're trying to watch her and you're trying to watch the screen in something that's a wonder, that's actually something that's quite difficult to do effectively. The second thing that happens, though, is they replace a lot of this dialogue between Theo and Julian with a bit about them passing a ping pong ball back and forth between their mouths. And it's something that it sells their chemistry it sells their history. She actually says, do you know how many people I've tried this with and nobody's been able to do this with me, right? Like, so you've got this moment where it's like, they're, they're still each other's flames, right? But on the page, what's important is character moment and they've deleted a lot of the dialogue and replaced it with teasing dialogue and ping pong balls for character moments and physical and visual um, stimuli, which the ping pong ball serves as both. Yes. I think, and the purpose is part of it is that they want to make it feel real time. The tension in this scene comes from the fact that it is playing out in real time and the feeling of panic and the being surrounded. So the 360 move from a directorial point of view makes us feel the tension and the, the riding with just like inside the car road helps create that sense of surrounding, but the 360 moves definitely add to that. What is interesting is that real timeness real-time feel is in the big print okay often when we talk about writing or even when i I teach my like beginning writing students it's like you actually want to compress time phone rings character gets out of their chair walks over picks up the receiver 
blah, blah, blah. That's normally stuff you just delete because the editor will delete it, right? We get no dramatic potential about a character getting up out of the chair, picking up the phone in a normal situation. Maybe it was a character that is like got their leg cut off and bleeding, you know, that adds more tension and them having to do it is like an obstacle. But in this, the big print is actually playing out moments in detail, right? The motorcycle creep and spins, throwing the gunman into the grass, driver bouncing across the pavement, leaving lots of skin behind. Luke slows the car just enough to execute a turn, spinning a 180, heading away from the ambush, final driving forward. You know, and then there's more, particularly when once Julian is shot, where it's kind of going into the detail. How they're trying to deal with the wound, because that is additional tension. It's it's quite, a, you know, in a very clinical way, it's an obstacle that they're trying to deal with that's escalated the situation. Right, that the, the kind of situation is one up. So the big print is actually giving us a lot of detail of the moment by moment this happening in the action because it wants it real time. And I think because the moment is so tense that you can get away with that. You don't sit there and go, oh, can this action line just be like the motorcycle explodes? And instead it gives us the detail of like them tumbling and stuff. You know, it's it's alluding to the the stunt work, but it's actually more specific, keeping us in this it's real time. They're not compressing the time in the the choices and the action lines. Yeah, like you said, it draws the audience's attention to this as a one Like, you know, to paraphrase Tony Gore, no cutting, no cheating, right? Whether they cheated with VFX is another question, but it draws the audience's attention to a one before then the action starts. So I think that is a good example of when it's worth drawing the audience's attention to the camera work because it then sets up a narrative purpose. I mean, they're also, they're not afraid of, obviously, there's really super short single lines of action, but like Tintin, they're not, and like Goodfellas, they're not afraid of longer blocks of text, but they, just like in Tintin, they're using punctuation to create that staccato feel. Mm. So, you know, you've got instead, comma, Luke throws the car into reverse, comma, screeching the car backwards, full stop, the Zed's upon them, comma, running down the car, full stop, crack, exclamation mark, sticks and fists pounding, comma, bodies piling on, ellipsis. So, the you know, almost any, you know, subsection of a sentence in there is no more than three or four words. No, no. So, it, even though it's not like having lots of white space, it's just like pounding you with the rhythm of the text. And it's a very it's a very different type of rhythm than the other two. Mm. But they all have their own internal rhythms. Like this one has a lot fewer it introduces stuff in the big text just the first time, like burning car or whatever. The first time it's all in caps, the rest of the time it's just taken as part of the scene, which is completely unlike Tintin. It's all like one line, staccato, couple of words here, couple of words there. There's a few like blank stares you know, spot something, very short thing. So it's it's very different than the other two, but they're all establishing their own rhythm. Mm. So should we just quickly summarize, like Children of Men, I think, you know, I was fighting for it to be the first uh, (laughs) one that we did, but I think it's good that it's the last because I think it it draws on all the tools that we previously identified from the two previous examples. For me, the big tools that it uses is, to Stu's point, it suggests the one by constantly orienting things from the characters in the car. Like you said, it's, you know, Miriam notices in Luke's rear view mirror through the windshield. And then obviously those mini slugs in the multipla, you know, or road, you know, the bike. I'm sure it's some sort of British specific car thing. And then what they've all done is, you know, they have thinned out the writing, even if they've used different approaches to white space they've all thinned out the pace of the words and the the length of the sentences and the use of punctuation. Yeah, and I think if people, you know, you will often get the note, oh, you need to write this scene from the point of view of the character. And what is interesting in all these scenes is the sensory experience is written from the point of view of the character. So, it's worth studying the scripts of all these three films to see how they do that, particularly Children of Men, because of those connections to hearing the sounds outside, but also hereditary, which we mentioned, because it speaks to intention. And look, you can absolutely do the Tony Gilroy, no cuts, no cheating kind of idea. I've used that in a horror script. There was kind of like almost a Children of Men inspiration where it was like a zombie script. It was just a rewrite job. And 
There were a bunch of people attacking the character was in the back of this car and kind of pulls the handbrake and lays in the back of the car, right? And this was low budget. So the, we specifically wrote, we hold on the character, no cuts, no cheating, but we also then wrote in the sound. sound. And I don't even wonder if we needed the no cuts, no cheating. We, we could have just, just written, we hold on the terror, like the tension or whatever, and just spoken more about what they were hearing around them. Because the idea is that we weren't going to see the car plow through the zombies. We're just going to hold on this character, hear it, then cut to a wide shot of the car already placed, the picture vehicle already placed in the position, right? right? So we didn't actually have to do the stunt. That was the idea. So I think this has kind of told me that you can kind of not do that because sometimes it doesn't matter. Chaz and I are looking at this scene in the script that we're working at the moment, and and we kind of talked about, I mentioned that I was thinking about shooting in the one but really what I'm interested in is the real-time feel, and maybe it ends up being two shots that are properly cut right, that we don't try to stitch them because it's not about that. Maybe we do stitch them, but from the writing point of view on the page, the intentionality is that we this is playing out, this is a big horror moment, it's playing out in real time and we are within the experience of our protagonist and we should be writing it from what they see. So if these other characters come off, we don't cut to them, we may just talk about them being a murmur, hear their panic. Right, and we don't write the dialogue like in a shooting script or on the day. We might have to write out what they're saying. The actors know what their business is, but the experience of the moment is that it's kind of myopic. Yeah, and like my key learning from this is that I've overwritten that. Like I'm really focused on like saying we are in X's point of view, like heartbeat thundering in his ears, that kind of stuff, because. I'm hitting on the head overly the intention and I think I can achieve the same thing by just shortening the sentences or shortening the clauses to this really tight format. And it could just be going the cat, you know, we hold on Nicola if he is overwhelmed by, because really what we're talking about is being overwhelmed. I mean, that's kind of what children of men is. It's not like anxiety overwhelm. It's kind of like literally just being surrounded in that sense of panic and the, the kind of all this stuff going on in the real time and it's like them struggling to kind of get control back. I mean, like, yeah, just a- another one. Siren screaming, comma, the police car following, comma, getting closer, full stop, Luke's- Luke keeps driving. The longest section of sentence in that is four words. <laughs> but it has talked about what the car is doing in a little bit more detail to create this sense of it happening in real time because there is tension in the police vehicles approaching, Right. It doesn't just say the police vehicles approach or police vehicles thunder. It's kind of actually used a little bit more words than necessary in order to make it feel more real time. To me, anyway, that's how I interpret that. I mean, my key learning from the whole exercise, other than tightening the words on the page, is like that use of repetition and anchoring, like really at the beginning of sentences, Mm. what's happening, where like orienting the read is the biggest thing that I think I've taken out of this. It does create an immediacy to to Mm. write in brutal form, constantly starting with whatever the key, either piece of action or, you know, key character that you're starting with. But like Sue says repetition, and I think that's one of my, mine is like rhythm and flow. And and you can establish that in different ways, whether it's how you use punctuation, whether it's how you use all caps, whether it's one big block of text, whether it's every sentence is its own line. You're establishing a rhythm and flow that fits the feel of your scene. And that fit is hopefully in service of your overall theme, your overall intent with the scene, your overall character's point of view, etc. So it, it could change slightly, but that's what's super important is establishing that rhythm and flow. Yeah. Because what we're talking about is is creating immediacy and urgency. And that seems to be the the way that these writers have all writing three very different types of scenes have all created a sense of immediacy, primarily through rhythm. I mean, I think you say they're different types of scenes. I think they're all kind of set these scenes, right? Particularly Children and Men and Jintian are set these action scenes. And even if they weren't one, as they're worth reading in terms of seeing how they make excellent set pieces. And they've spent time polishing the pro do that, right? They haven't done the equivalent of they fight, right? They've written in the actions. Godfellas is interesting because it's definitely a set piece moment, right, in the story, and her getting sucked into the underworld of the mafia, but it doesn't draw his attention. Like, in a way, the all the present men conversation is a set piece, right? Like, it's seen Bob Wood would do journalism really well, <laughs> right? It's a set piece by nature of being a oneer, but it's not all action set piece per se. Yeah, yeah, but it's, I mean, dramatically, it is kind of a set piece. Sure, dramatically, character or 
it's a turning point, whatever. Same with hunger. That is a sense set piece conversation that's yeah. really important. I think that's and I just think it's just interesting in the age of like these CGI ones. Yeah. Right? Where you get like, oh, a bunch of CGI carriages on the battlefield and the camera swoops between them. Mm. So the scale of the fighting and all that kind of stuff. But I, I think it kind of works backwards. That doesn't come with intentionality. And even hereditary's end moment, that is the climax of the film. It's it's why that it is there, right? To kind of hold with Peter. And interestingly, I think that's part of the reason we've been talking about it with our moment. It's an absolutely pivotal moment for the character. And for us, the reason we're talking the quote-unquote one really we're talking about real time, is to take the character from the point of confrontation with the horror to them making a really awful decision. And getting the audience over the line with that is actually like, let's just stick within this character's experience. And when they're like, we have to do this horrible thing, we know where they're coming from and we're kind of with them with the decision. And then hopefully, ultimately, when the character's confronted by the... Uh, dirtiness of what they've done we are as well so intentionality it's all always and so when you're directing from the page i think what you really need to be thinking about is i'm directing what is the intention behind this the, the, the directing the cinematographer will work out how to realize it in terms of camera lenses and stuff like that and maybe they end up using three shots maybe they use one that's stitched together but the intentionality is what's going to inform their choices there and i think that should be what's going on rather than i mean sometimes angled on or notice is the best way to call out the intentionality of like, we need to have a close up on this thing. But from a dramatic point of view, always coming back to what is your intention as the writer here? The intention is that, like, I think all the writing services, whether it's the theme, whether it's the character point of view, whether it's the quote unquote feel, whether it's the overwhelm or the charisma or the awe. That's exactly what it is. And I really enjoy the way that they have very different approaches, but they all show their craft in the writing as well as the actual filming and directing. All right. So, as always, thanks to our amazing patrons who bring you more Draft Zero more often, particularly when one of us is on the other side of the planet and then we will cross to opposite sides of the planet in a few weeks. You guys do it. And also thank you so much for all the homework suggestions that our patrons supplied on this episode. It was super helpful. But as always, particular shout outs to our amazingest patrons, of which there is a new one. So thanks to Lily, Alexandra, Casimir, Eduardo, Jen, Thomas, Garrett, Randy, Jesse, Sandra, Thies, Alex, and Crob. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. Lily's been a patron for a long time, but she bumped up to get a name called out. So <laughs> pew, pew, pew. And thanks to you, Mel and Stu, for making this episode work, even though we decided on the homework literally five minutes before we started to record it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again to Megan May for reading our script excerpts. You can also hear her melodious voice on Starship Q-Star, which she co-wrote and co-produced, and also is the voice of the titular Starship on Starship Q-Star. Pun intended. I hope you all feel like arguing with either Stu or myself about anything on this episode or anything in general. And you can find many ways of getting in touch with us at our website at draft-zero.com at the website, you'll also find the show notes for this and all our other episodes. As well as links to support us and spread the word for free via a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Very important for spreading the word. Or if you think that what we do here is worth a dollar or preferably more than a dollar, then you can also find links to our Patreon page to support us getting these episodes to you quicker. Thanks. And um, thanks for listening.